Okay, well, hello everybody. Welcome to another Friday CCOM seminar. Um, that's not my fault. Um, uh, just before we begin, just for folks that are possibly interested in kickball, if folks could like meet outside just after a seminar and we'll kind of get a head count and hopefully we'll have a good time all game today. Um, today's seminar speaker is Carverium Kirchware. He's going to be talking about IRMA, the Environmental Response Management application that was used to help with the um, response to the deep water horizon. Kurt started working on IRMA in 2006 with Rob Braswell over in Complex Systems in Moore Hall. And he's also worked on similar systems at NASA related to Mars missions, looking at situational awareness and uh, workflow tools that are web based. Um, as well as writing a custom GIS software in the 1990s that also helped with um, Mars spacecraft missions. And for Irma, he's really been involved with the system architecture and design and configuration of the software, um, as well as the tracking of ships and the personnel and duties, and also implementing water level tides, bathymetry, and backscatter data to be present in Irma. Thanks. Um, just before you started, I have not actually been down for this bill. When I was on this response, I was actually in Dover most of the time, <laughs> which is really uh, not very close to Mississippi and Louisiana and uh, Florida. Um, what you're going to see today is mostly based on work um, that I did remotely on the computers. Um, what you saw up here on, as you came in on these photographs, uh, I stole those from the people. I didn't think I saw one of those pictures. Um, and this is just to give you guys a flavor of, of what it is out there that you don't really know what's going on. It's kind of crazy and wild, and it's hard to get a sense of things, even you know, listen to people who are out there trying to get a sense of what's going on. It's kind of challenging. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a, a history of, of sort of where Irma came from and uh, how it's been used so far and where it might be going. Uh, I want to start off by showing you sort of um, <clears throat> sometimes history comes back and bites you. Uh, this up here on the top right is uh, a picture of a board game that, that BP put out in the 70s called Oil Strike. And apparently one of the features it had is you draw a card and you have an oil spill. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately, um, not so happy. Um, this is something that, uh, thanks to John Kelly, I just found out about yesterday, um, that actually Irma and GeoPlatform, the ERC GeoPlatform, uh, it's a separate project, but it uses Irma um, for at least the default horizon. Just won an award from a magazine called the Government Computing Network, I think. Um, and uh, so we're getting acknowledged for some of the work we've done with uh, the spill response, which is very nice. And most important to remember up here is that I might be presenting this, but a lot of people have put a lot of time and energy and uh, paid and unpaid time in that, so sometimes people have been donating a lot of stuff to us, and uh, we really appreciate that. I want to call out three people that are up here uh, specifically. Rob Braswell um, helped create the initial version with Michelle Jacoby and I. Uh, the three of us spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what it was we were trying to accomplish. And uh, Aaron Rasikot is a uh, contractor in Seattle who I've never actually met, but uh, he and I have pulled all nighters on this, trying to make sure that uh, everything was working for the spell response folks down there. Golf. Uh, Aaron has uh, put in more hours than I think is humanly possible in the last four months on this. And I'm sure I'm missing people in here from uh, various places at UNH that have put in huge amounts of time. There's just so many folks involved in this trying to make it happen. And it's important to know uh, when people have biases or not, and you can judge this on your own. Um, I actually have taken money from BP in the past. So you can uh, judge my bias based on that. Uh, I did some work for my PhD with them. And uh, I'll show you uh, some pictures that come from an Exxon event. And I did actually uh, get a grad uh, training out of Exxon for a little while. All right, so let's go back to 2006 and uh, give you a little bit of history. Uh, talking to some managers uh, for spill response, trying to figure out how they do stuff. I asked the question, how do you track what's going on to this guy who's an incident commander? And uh, he was very happy to answer me. And the spill coordinator responded with, we call him every 15 to 30 minutes on the radio and say, hey, where are you? And then we write down the latitude and longitude, and uh, we're good. That's great. Works wonderful. You know. 
Um, that's my response. <laughs> um, that's great when you have one response vehicle, maybe two, three, four. Uh, Deepwater Horizon, they sent me a list of 3,000 ships. Um, I'm not going to try and call 3,000 people in 15 minutes and get their lat longs right through down right and get them up on a map. It's just not going to work. So let's think about um, the typical situation that people train for with a spill response. Uh, typically, um, it's a ship that has some sort of problem, it dumps some oil in the water, and you go and you deal with it. You try to mitigate as best you can. We have a database full of these. A missile is the Coast Guard system. It's supposed to be your incident response uh, tracking system. It's uh, protected, so I have actually never seen the real front screen of it. Um, there's a little red light over it when it's running. Um, but out of it comes a list of incidents that they track. And these are all spills uh, or collisions when somebody runs into something or two ships run into each other for a collision um, or fires on ships. These are things that dump oil and other materials in the water you've got to send out an incident to before. So we've got a pretty good handle that they occur fairly often. Um, every so often we get a big one. This is uh, the Exxon Valdez. Some of you might remember this from uh, 1989. Uh, it's a huge event. And you know, it really was a huge amount of oil in the Prince William Sound, but it was a contained environment. So you'll see later on that this isn't always the case. Um, a little bit closer to home, Alaska, for most of us, is far away. Um, the Costco was on in San Francisco Bay. Actually, it didn't dump that much bunker oil in the water, but it did a lot of damage. It was big on the news. Um, this is just a ship bumping into a bridge. It really wasn't that major of an event. But uh, here's a boat with some people on it to give you a sense of the scale of what could happen when a large ship runs into a non-moving object. Uh, the neat thing that's been happening in the last 10 years is we now have technologies that track ships. So we can get data about who's going where, why, and uh, when things go wrong, we can go back and see what happened. So here you can see um, in blue uh, is the tug Revolution that was alongside the Costco was on taking it out of the San Francisco Bay here. They headed out toward the Bay Bridge. Uh, they're supposed to go over here, and they went over where there's a bridge above them and uh, clipped it. And then they went off to a holding spot. The Coast Guard sent them down here while they were leaking oil, and they sent the tug back home to go away. Um, so now we can see what's going on with the incident. Uh, while it's happening, after the fact, we can analyze what's going on. We can think about the future. To bring it home, this is off of Boston. In uh, February 2008, um, at 3 a.m. in the morning, an LNG ship full of natural gas, this is liquid natural gas, lost all power. And uh, we were very lucky that weekend, or day, when uh, that happened, the winds and currents were offshore. We got really lucky that ship got pushed away, they had time to get the ship restored. Uh, it took them quite a few hours to get the engines running again. Uh, if that had gone the other direction, it would have been into Boston, and we would have had uh, a pretty scary event with an uncontrolled LNG ship, basically a giant floating bomb coming around. The cool thing here is, when the ship had the incident, we had a crew that did something that very other few crews had done to date. They actually marked their ship as not under command, so that hopefully people watching on their, their ship tracking devices would actually see that this ship didn't know where it was going, and it was under control of winds and waves, and not the actual ship. So basically, with that kind of information, we can ask the question of, can we evaluate these risks and can we mitigate them? And Mariners have had tools to do this for a long time. <coughs> Um, this is the source data diagram for a chart. It tells you something about when the chart was done. Uh, you can see that some of the chart came from 1842 um, all the way up through uh, 2002. And it gives a mariner a way to sort of evaluate what's going on and do a risk assessment of when they're going through an area um, about the quality of the data they're using and uh, whether or not they want to transit a particular direction. So when people are uh, looking where to go, like say uh, Shep here, um, they work with their charts, they can figure out what kind of risks they're willing to take with their ship. From the shore side, we can start looking at uh, how many ships are going in what areas, and do we have a risk of collisions because there's too many ships near each other? Um, are they going near objects that are dangerous? Uh, are they coming into contact with, say, whales or things that they might hit? And you can start doing that risk analysis. Uh, we can go look in detail. This is uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And we can start looking at types of ships uh, how deep their draft is, and what they might be doing. So if we go look into part of the harbor, you can see here individual ship tracks. You can do, say, things like cluster analysis and figure out 
you know, what kind of ships are using this waterway? Um, there's an area just north of here where all the ships with explosives on them are supposed to go uh, anchor. And the, the folks without explosives are supposed to anchor over here. So you can start looking at the risks of having the ships in those areas. Are people following the rules and what's going on? And match that up with what's the intended use for the area and, uh, and how things are going. Uh, in this area, we actually have ships that are, that are brushing the bottom. You can see in multi-beam sonar surveys of the area that the people are actually going through the mud. So we have uh, clearances of negative centimeters below between the ship and the bottom. That's, that's all great until there's a, an old anchor or something in the way. The idea then is you can build a system that's going to watch the environment and do risk analysis. So here's uh, some figures from Brian Calder that, that look at this and, and look at the risk of grounding and uh, having a ship incident where you have to have a response sent out. And then you can try to mitigate that. You can tell a ship, I'm sorry, you can't come in for this tidal regime because there's just not enough water between you and the bottom for our particular harbor. And uh, you might also be able to look at the kind of ship and say, well, you know what, your ship doesn't have any real risk. If you run aground, you're going to be stuck for two hours and it'll get you off, doesn't really matter. Uh, things like this happen in the Mississippi River where they, they have ground things all the time. They just have to get someone out there, pull them off, and then the barges just keep going. Uh, the real message here is that no matter how hard you work to reduce those, you still will have bad things that happen. Um, you don't want them to have them there as often, but no matter what we do, we're still going to have to go out there and deal with problems when they happen. And uh, we do a lot to be prepared. Uh, here is one of our students going through fire safety training, uh, getting ready to put out a fire. Um, so we have to think about what's going to happen when things go wrong and can we, can we deal with that. So how are we going to respond as not just a person, but as a whole country when something goes wrong. You, know, you send out the Coast Guard, and uh, hopefully they're going to get out there and make the day go better. Uh, this is one of our, our new boats. This goes uh, 40 knots. So if you need somebody out there fast, we've got some really great ships. But we need to back them up with information that gets them to the right spot. We had an incident where um, the Coast Guard, due to old satellites, sent an incident response to the Gulf when somebody was off of Virginia having troubles because the satellite couldn't tell Atlantic versus Gulf. And we need to improve our systems so that we can get these hardworking folks on the water out to the right spot at the right gear. Uh, in the past, and still, uh, the most common thing you're going to see is a PDF and a big poster. So look around the walls here and see these maps. And think about how old they are. Um, you may print out a map that's stuck in time. And if you want to go figure out where something is, you're going to go have to look at the size and calculate where it is and say, OK, I need to get my ship over here. I'm not going to do that. You can't put that paper and show it into your chart plotter on your ship and get yourself someplace. You're going to have to go integrate it into your map system by hand. You need to start thinking about how to take these things. And they get fancier, and they give you contours. But how can we get that into the electronic form? Um, and I'd like to show you guys this one, which illustrates the time feature. And uh, when oil spills are just happening, those first few hours, if it's a ship that's just like a bit of oil, if you can catch that oil quickly, it's not going to get near marshes and the rocks and whatnot and be hard to clean. You can put a boom around it and get it contained. Uh, this was an overflight on the 28th at 1800. This map came out the next day on the 29th, and it probably didn't get out to people for another maybe six, eight hours in the field. So all that time went by. This oil is sitting on water. It's not going to hang out there. There's wind, there's waves, there's currents. It's going to go someplace. And so if you've got yesterday's map of where the oil is, you have no idea where the oil is today. So the solution needs to be that we need to provide some way to assist in those first few hours. That was the goal of, of uh, IRMA, or as early instances it's called Portsmouth Response, was to create a technique where we could go out and figure out how to give everybody a head start. You, know, you may still want to make those paper plots, but you need that right now information. You should have just gotten off a plane, you dropped you in a boat, you've got to go get some oil. Uh, what can you have in your hands that's going to make your day go better? This is what the Coast Guard has. Um, these are some of the few public release pictures that I've been able to get of some of their systems. This is them tracking ships. And this is the Gulf of Mexico. It's a giant yellow and blue blob of ships. Uh, there's probably 2,000 ships in that wall, and so the Roland ship right here is somewhere between here and over here. Uh, that's a pretty big area. It's the size of Texas. So tools like this are for a good first cut, but we do a lot better. Um, there's a, 
web tools, if it's start starting to get going, they can only be used by a few people, they're all restricted, and uh, they've got a bunch of green dots that slowly crawl around on the screen. Uh, we talked to the EPA at the beginning of this. They came and uh, visited with the, the Coastal Response Research Center and uh, a bunch of researchers working on IRMA and other response related stuff, and they gave us a tour of their website. They've been doing emergency response for a long time, and they've been trying to modernize. And they have a really great tracking system for all the chemicals and whatnot. And some of you might remember in Danvers, in I think 2006, there was a large explosion that actually uh, registered along the seismometers around here. Um, I, a chemical plant blew up, and it was a really big event. They uh, had a lot of response to work to do. Uh, so this is, these are the, the pictures from it in their actual database. They've got some summary stuff. You can download documents. Lots of pictures that the EPA staff took as they were out working on the scene. Uh, you'll notice there's no map. Um, there's no incident site map that you can go zoom into and see which part of the town is affected. Uh, it's just not a mapping tool. It's a, it's a really great website, but it doesn't have that spatial GIS component that's so important to response. So we'd like to take this uh, IRMA concept and basically provide them that quick look uh, environment. And this actually came out of some of the GIS ARC users uh, who are in these, these responses. They show up with their ArcGIS and they have no data to feed it. They've never been to this part of the country, they've never trained over here, or there's just too much going on and they've got users who don't know how to use Arc. And they're trying to manage the teams. Uh, they actually asked for uh, an interface that was a little bit better than Arc IMS with a little bit more scrolling Google Maps kind of feel where people could get a quick look at data, maybe not do as much analysis, but get that, you know, get people moving, track what's going on, and keep that sort of common operational picture that people like to have, or COP, that keeps you uh, abreast of what's going on in the environment. So we came up with uh, a scheme of trying to be able to get data uh, to and from ships, uh, get it back to an IRMA data center, and uh, then start integrating with other people. And so I show up here at Now Coast, which uh, is actually uh, started off upstairs, I think now has computers in Silver Spring in here, and then you know, integrate with tools like uh, the VizLab's column layers, FlowViz 2D, and be able to start bringing those, those data and visualizations through the system and get them out to the people in the field. So the idea is you want to take data from all of your different sources, you know, federal through local, get it into some big database, get it out through some interfaces, and get it out to the people who need it. So through some web interface, you want people who use ArcGIS to grab that same data. You don't want them searching all over the web to try and find things. Um, you want them to be able to get those models of where it was going in the environment. You want people who just need a web interface just to go look at a map, be able to do that. And if someone, say, is using something like Google Earth or uh, NASA Worldwind, you want to be able to just get data to all those places easily and flexibly. And uh, the ArcGIS tools just weren't doing it for NOAA and the other responders. So what we did is we took a step back and, and said, what are the requirements and what do we need to do? And as a result, some of the commercial tools just weren't really up to the task. They weren't flexible enough. They're really powerful. They do great work. But we need the, the uh, open source and open protocols uh, strategy to go in and to be able to control things ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of really expensive, complicated tools for oil spill response. And if you go to any particular company, you'll find they've got four or five of them, spending 50 or $100,000 on some of these things you know, for one or two copies. That means when a small response group joins in, they've got to go buy that same software, go through a whole purchasing process, and already you're in trouble. You know, the, the scalability in there, it's doable, but it's time scales are just too short uh, with an environment response to be able to go through the procurement and deal with all that kind of stuff. So I want to show you one example of how that can pay off. You may have heard of OpenStreetMap. Um, in this interface, it's uh, people go out with GPSs and they, they drive around and they walk trails. They put it all into the system and they generate a map. And uh, so it's user contributed data. It's sort of the crowdsourcing mode. And uh, this is Haiti, Port-au-Prince, right after the, uh, the big earthquake. And before this, there was almost no mapping in this area. And these were all volunteers who jumped in and quickly made a map of the area so that first responders could be out there with a real map. Uh, the great part about this is save your enforcement and uh, ship hits a bridge. Uh, if you want to go to Google and get them to change their map data, it might be quite a while until you find the right person to do it, they get permission to do it, they verify that the bridge is out. Uh, meanwhile, you have to bring out firefighters who don't have a, a, like a Google Maps way to go in and say, I need to get from here to there, but suddenly I'm missing the bridge that I use every day. 
with OpenStreetMap, we can go in, we can flag that bridge is gone, and the routing tools will get the firemen right to where they need to go. They just, the map tools will know they need to take a detour. Uh, a side benefit of this, without having some of these big companies in the way, sometimes like uh, ESRI, is we actually went out and hired one of the authors of the tools we use. Uh, Chris Schmidt is uh, down in Boston, never gotten to meet him, but he's written Open Layers, which is the interface that drives our maps, and Feature Server, which lets us draw little things on the maps and then save them as uh, GIS layers. Uh, he actually uh, was contacted by one of our engineers, and he wrote an interface to one of our databases to allow some management of some of the ship tracking data, because I was just doing too much stuff and didn't have time to get into it. So we went right to the source, and we hired one of those guys, and uh, over one weekend, he produced us a really neat interface for us that we've been using. Uh, so we have some flow charts. I figured I'll show that real quick. The, we have data flowing around. Uh, the key thing is that you, some of the stuff you see today is hidden behind an encrypted layer. You can't log in as the public, but the uh, first responders can log in. Um, the idea is that we have some data that's public and some data that's not. Uh, for those who are rushing out, so here's Tom rushing out to a pseudo emergency with his buoys. Just keep it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a fortuitous uh, slide because we used this picture of Tom quite a couple years ago uh, going out with buoys, uh, going out with Chico as fast as possible, just because that's fun. Uh, but Tom ended up spending quite a bit of time out there for the emergency response. So, to create a first prototype of this, rather than go out somewhere, uh, a lot of people wanted us to go to Chesapeake, uh, places where there's a lot of shipping, or even to Boston. We wanted to work someplace where, as UNH, we can really dig into the topic. We don't have to be traveling all the time. We can get out there and get going. So we started with Portsmouth Response. We wanted to work in our backyard and see if we can solve the problem here in our little corner where it's a little bit more constrained. So we created an initial prototype. This is uh, probably February or January of 2007. With basically taking S57 in, this is stuff you've seen with Roland and GeoZooey, uh, put it into a map interface, create some layers, start integrating stuff from NOAA, and uh, you know, going off to some of the ocean observing groups, and being able to start pulling things together with some of these web technologies you might have seen on Google Maps and Yahoo Maps. And you can see, we're still on the prototype stage here, because it says draw a logo here, but we weren't sure who was going to work with us. And then we started looking at what we could possibly do. Can we get the in there? Well, it's not a 3D interface like GeoZooey with Layer Mouse, but you can make a nice GeoTIP and drop in a GeoTIP pretty quickly with these tools. Uh, we use something called uh, Boodle or GDAL uh, to take geotips from tools and just drop them right into an interface where you upload a file and magically you've now got a new layer with your bathymetry in there. Uh, we started working on how to get legends. Legends turn out to be a word of pain, making nice icons for things and making them show up cleanly from ArcGIS or some of the other tools and that being a lot of time. And then things are getting more polished. We, uh, we have more data layers. You can see that there's now more groups of stuff up here. We've got field photographs going in. We've gotten as much bathymetry as I could find from our archives up there. Uh, this will be a little contribution that Val helped me put in there. Um, we're going to get an interface that's a little bit more usable. We've got more things going on. Luciano jumped in with some of his backscatter data. Uh, we loaded that up one afternoon just to see what, what would the responder want. It turns out most of the responders don't even know what backscatter is. So, uh, we got some educational issues to go along with some of this data, beyond just metadata. Uh, I do a lot of ship tracking with AIS. We tried bringing in some of the AIS. So here's a ship, and we're actually starting to track uh, with receivers in uh, Newcastle and Jackson Lab, which aren't there at the moment because we're, we're now using a Coast Guard receiver. But we're being able to track stuff. Uh, Andy McLeod and I went to several vessels, and we actually put AIS transponders or transceivers uh, on ships. This is uh, the Portsmouth Response group. Uh, there's some boom in here over here to catch oil. So here's Andy installing an AIS uh, transceiver. And based on that, we now have uh, the, the vessel CRC test one. So we can actually watch a response vessel going through uh, its drills. Turns out he drives up here, he has lunch, and he comes back, and that's a, a drill. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a little more realism in our drills. And to bring it home, you might recognize this vessel. We put our uh, transceivers on, on our two vessels. So here's the Cochico heading out. And this gives you the ability to start tracking your vessels and seeing what they're going on with them, whether or not you're on them. Uh, you may not have time to be out there watching with binoculars or in the Coast Guard, you're there all the time watching. But it gives people back in the office to see what's going on in the waterway. So here we have a tug. 
right at the entrance to our harbor, meeting up with a large, uh, uh, not sure which kind of ship that is, but it's a big uh, container ship of some sort, and uh, they're heading up into the harbor. So you can keep track of what's going on in your harbor. And you can also start keeping track of things like um, cell phones and other stuff like that. Um, this, this is a uh, shoreline classification. So uh, how oil interacts with shorelines is really important to first responders. They want to be able to know where are the areas that the oil is going to get really stuck that they want to get out of first and prioritize. And they also want to look at habitats, what, are the, what animals or what plants are in the environment that they need to protect. And combine that with their plans. So before 2001, September, all these plans were public. Uh, since that terrorist attack, the government decided it's better to keep your response plans hidden. So the problem with this is that first responders don't have access to those until it becomes critical. So you need to, you know, on the fly, be teaching people what they should have been able to know ahead of time. So this interface lets them see, okay, we're planning to deploy boats here with booms. Here's where all the gear is stashed around our harbor. Um, and then, you know, what are the shorelines and, and how are you going to be managing this stuff in the waterway when you've just gotten off a plane from some other part of the country? Uh, there's other things in here like uh, classification zones, how you're going to get in and out of water, where you're going to deploy booms. All that stuff is encoded into Irma, so when you show up and turn on the interface, you should be able to get going. Uh, one of the things we did with uh, CECOM and CoOps with Carl um, is we want to be able to get more real time data in there along with the AIS. So here's water level pulled from co-ops. The, the great part of the internet is you can start gluing things together without having to make any official interfaces. So Carl walked us through how to get data. We have a little icon you click on with a little water level, and uh, magically you'll see that tie station pop up in the interface. So you can right away get a sense of what's going on with the water and the oil and all that at the same time. After building that interface, we weren't sure how, it, how this was going to grow. So the next step was to try and add another area and see what we can do. Um, I'm not sure why the, the Puerto Rico was picked, but uh, they decided that, that area would be our, our next good stop. I know that there have been a lot of groundings on the reefs in the last two or three years they've tried to have you look at. Uh, for some reason, ships like to run into reefs. Uh, but we tried to grow out into Puerto Rico, and we had some growing pains. Here's some pretty ugly AIS tracks of ships. Um, you know, figuring out how to get rid of data that you don't want to see when all you care about is down here. We managed to, to work through some procedures to try and get things a little bit more efficient. We were able to add layers in a lot less time than the first time around. We did pretty well. And the question then became, as you're growing, we're a research institution. We don't want to be in people who are uh, showing up for every response. I'm here to do research. I'm not here to be the one in the field picking up the oil or tracking it all the time. How do we transition this to NOAA? And uh, how do we jump into these drills and get the cross-training between what we know here and come up with and what's going to work in the field. As a part of that, earlier this year we had a, it's called a spill of national significance or SONS drill. Uh, it happened, the, the headquarters was up in Portland, Maine, and uh, this was in March of 2010. A nice little fancy logo, and uh, they had a nice test thing, they had actual new broadcast saying this is an exercise, and some guy looking very sad about all the, uh, the oil and the waterways of, of, of the, uh, this category. And uh, so we actually used Irma with responders, and so they, they were looking at this interface. Here's just a screen grab that I ran over someone's screen and hit print screen on them uh, just to see what they're looking at. We had uh, responders. They've all got their little team it's on their back, the logistics or command or uh, the finance ladies were having a great time. I think they didn't get to go out the field very often. Um, they were probably the most organized batch I've ever seen. Um, these guys are looking at or am I trying to make decisions about how to deal with the response. Um, we started getting people congregating around some of the screens, trying to figure out how they're going to deal with stuff, where things are located. Um, one thing that I noticed, though, is that when the command team got together to make the final decision, there's not a single computer display, let alone a laptop or a, even a cell phone here. These guys are all on paper. There's a computer display about relative to these guys, about where this is. None of them even looked over there. They've all got their notepads, and then they walked away after they made their decision. And I don't think anybody at the five tables around had any idea what happened to that command table. And that's what's controlling all that's, uh, what's going on. So it's, it's a little tough. And the basic conclusion that I came away with from Solons is a pretty sobering one. And uh, 
No one calls this a hot wash, where you basically, you know, you're going to go take your laundry and get it clean afterwards. You're going to figure out all the things that weren't quite right. Well, my conclusion was not right. So here's some of the things that I saw. One, faking data is difficult. Um, if you don't have oil and water, you've got to have a modeler go think about what would happen, and then he's got to go sketch it out, and all his tools are used to dealing with real data. Um, so a lot of the techniques are not designed to inject fake data and then go create a scenario that matches something that could be realistic. It's very hard to create realistic data. <coughs> Location names caused huge amounts of trouble. Someone shouting out a name from across the room, like Skatequa, if you didn't know how to spell it, you know how to Google it. Um, people uh, confuse Point and Rock and all sorts of different things and mix them up with their names. Uh, we had several cases of people running over with a post-it, taking it on a screen, saying, you need to deploy here. Well, nobody could find that spot. It was a typo. Someone had just shouted it out, wrote it down, played the telephone game, called someone else. And by the time it got to the command center, nobody had any idea where it was. Uh, there was a little or no use of charts or the Coast Pilots. People looked at me funny when I pulled up the Coast Pilot to try and figure out one of those names and finally found it in the Coast Pilot as a, a pretty horrible misspelling. Um, I didn't see any charts on tables, didn't see charts on computers. They're supposed to be moving ships around harbors. I'm not sure how they, they need to accomplish that in this, these kinds of cases. Um, I asked which vessels are involved. You know, you're doing a test here, you might be moving ships around on paper, you might be moving around for real. Uh, I finally saw a newscast on, uh, on a TV in the corner from some reporter, and I saw a ship, I saw a name off the back, so we started tracking that one. Is the Coastie actually working in the, the, the project? But people didn't realize he was. And uh, of the ships we did find, very few of them had AIS transceivers on them so we could track them. We had some serious IT issues up in Portland. Uh, printing. Everybody loves their, their printouts, but yet they were all spending hours trying to figure out how to get the print drivers to work and all those things that you run into in the daily office. Uh, you've got everyone madly trying to figure out how they're going to print. Uh, when they've got a big computer screen next to them already showing the data right next to the command center. Um, there were so many people bringing in their laptops, the Wi-Fi got overloaded. I was one of the few people who was able to keep going, and I started using Irma on my own to show people, because I had my cell phone hooked up to my laptop. And that was working, but you know, all these, this expensive Wi-Fi gear they had going wasn't, wasn't working. And this is uh, in a case where we're in a drill, where things should be pretty mellow. We don't actually have oil in the water, we don't actually have you know, people hurt. Uh, it should be an easy case. Uh, communication, uh, as I said, it was more like rumors and no passing. Uh, when I was in high school, I think two people had cell phones. Uh, it was pretty wild back then. It was, they're acting like it's before texting. I didn't even see texting going on between people very much. And as a conclusion of that, I realized that, that our field personnel need a mobile device that's secure that they can send back <coughs> reports, where they can type in the name of the location in a way that they're not calling up and, and having someone else trying to write down what they need to say. Now that was in March. Um, this happened April 20th. So a month and a few days later, this is the deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, she, she's actually a ship, even though it's a drilling platform, this is a ship. Uh, she caught fire, exploded, 11 people died, uh, really horrible events. I remember hearing about it on, on a, a maritime news group and just was like, wait, what happened? I don't understand. Um, here's what she looked like. This is her sister ship being transported out of uh, being constructed to give you a sense of what this is. It's a pretty huge device. This is a large ship to start with, carrying an even larger unit <coughs> on top. So we had to scramble. We weren't ready. Uh, Irma was you know, just trying to roll out to to uh, both New England and uh, the Caribbean. I was thinking about maybe going other places. So five days later, we had something up. And you can see there's not a lot that I've got showing here. We're still working. We've got some categories, and we've got a few things sort of shoved in. So we weren't at all ready for this. We were really scrambling. We started getting things like charts in there, um, you know, basic stuff like that. And you start seeing some ships uh, that we lived along the beginning. My software wasn't ready for ships of this magnitude, I was handling a couple other ships, and uh, I didn't know how big the response area was, so I was trying to track 5,000 ships with code that wasn't really optimized by handling that many. But we did get there, and uh, we ended up finally, uh, this is uh, mid-July, the interface was actually working for the responders. Um, 
for those who had access, I know people on the ships didn't always get access to this uh, for those who were trying to look at it from some devices. So where does this data come from that we're trying to scramble and get? Uh, the key thing is here, by being open, we're taking data from all over the, the internet and sometimes all over the world. We're trying to glue it together in a consistent way for these people. Um, the AIS data came through some code that I wrote after the response started. Um, we were loading up several thousand ships in there. There's a technology called GeoRSS, which is really simple syndication. There's a way to like news feeds to tell you the location of something happening. We use those to uh, for sensors and things like that. Um, KML is the Google Earth format. There's a new addition to it uh, called Extended Data, which lets you, in addition to making a pretty Google Earth map, it actually brings in machine readable data with it. GeoJSON is a new technology for sending little bits around the, you know, the web. It's a very um, web-oriented protocol. Um, and then there's a critical one here called Web Mapping Service, and I'll show you a, bit, a little bit about that more. This is super important for things like Irma and uh, tools that are related to that, being able to share maps really easily across the internet. And it's a really crazy things. I learned about a new technology, well, it's an old technology that I didn't know about, called an SLDMV, which I have no idea what it stands for. It's a little buoy that they throw off the ships or out of the back of planes, I guess, for search and rescue. And the Coast Guard was very stressed out that I was being able to see this data, but they wanted to respond to see it. And they're now uh, tracking these buoys all around the, the Gulf. They throw them in the water, it's got a temperature sensor, and it drifts along, and it shows you, I guess, the current drift. You know, things like this I've never heard of before, but suddenly, you know, uh, five days after I've heard of it, it's supposed to be up on display, and people are supposed to be using this in the interface. Here's an example of the, um, the GeoRSS, being able to use things like Google Maps, and just taking an example file, here's those buoys, and being able to just throw that into Google Maps, and actually, these tools all know about these protocols. So I can take a GeoRSS, put the URL on Google Maps, and I suddenly have my buoys moving around on Google Maps. That kind of freaked out the Coast Guard, because they were trying to keep this data really protected, uh, but, but also get it out to everybody at the same time. So it's, it's a balancing act between getting stuff out and keeping it protected. Behind the scenes are a lot of rooms like this. This one over here on the right is referred to the zombie room by the people who live, live upstairs from it. Um, these are Coast Guard tracking stations. So these are the AIS receivers, on identification system receivers, uh, throughout the country. There's a good number of them down in the Gulf of Mexico. And based on that, this is what the Gulf looks like to me sitting back here. It's a bunch of these little dots crawling around. Uh, ants look like they move a lot faster. And, uh, the, the uh, oil spill actually happened down in this area, and uh, all the white ships are your uncategorized ships. And based on uh, various reports throughout the area, uh, I tried to come up with a list of ships that were involved in the response. People would give me, like, email me these uh, weird copies of fax reports that have been faxed about five times. Um, one of the things I learned about a John boat was that I actually don't care what a John boat is. <laughs> it's a small aluminum hull thing that uh, doesn't have enough space on it to really carry any tracking or anything like that. Uh, they sent me lists of hundreds of those, and then didn't say whether they were in the Gulf or in the Atlantic or in the Pacific. <laughs> From that, you had to figure out which of these ships are actually working on oil spill issues. And then, we also didn't know when they were leaving the area. So we've got ships over here that may or may not be doing oil spill stuff, but they're still tagged because at one point they were working on oil spill stuff. And here's an example of probably the, the best document I ever got saying which ships were involved. Uh, some of the stuff I got by watching the news and seeing when they were carrying out the containment dome, I would read the name of the ship off the newscast, go over the computer, try and find the ID number for it, and put it in the database so it would get tracked. Um, the thing is that we have Coast Guard ships in here. Uh, sometimes on these documents they'd say CGC for Coast Guard Cutter, but then when you go look at the ships broadcasting who they were, there would be a Harry out there. This means the CGC Harry uh, Claiborne, you just see Harry. And there will be 12 different Harrys running around in the Gulf of Mexico. You wonder which one is the Coast Guard ship? I'm not sure. Uh, very challenging situation. When you get it figured out, you then zoom in and you join the parking lot. Uh, I'm sure anyone who's been out there realized that nobody went anywhere very fast in this area. In fact, uh, SOG, here's a, I've hit info up here, clicked on the Ocean Veritas, which is a, a great a research ship, and uh, its speed over ground is zero. Uh, most of the ships in here had speed over ground of pretty close to zero all the time. Uh, it basically, from, from these maps, it looked like you know, a giant tangled mess. 
Now, one thing that became apparent very quickly is that we had a lot of restricted data, and uh, Noah had a process for allowing who could see and who couldn't. Um, there was a request from up high, like on the admiral level, saying, I really like to see this data go out to the public, so anyone can see the responses going on, what ships are out there, and who's involved. And the Coast Guard's response from the operations center was, absolutely no way. That's illegal. You can't do it. Over my dead body. Now, we do have precedents. This is the Healy. Um, one of our computers in our building here is getting an email from the Healy every hour. It's sending out a nice science summary of what's going on with the Healy. It's sending it, uh, taking a, a picture that's, that's stored at the launch on the web, geo-referencing it and putting it on Google Earth, and actually sending it back to Google. So if you go into Google Earth, turn on the ocean expedition layer, fly to where the Healy is, you'll actually see her moving around on the, on the map. Um, Admiral Allen, who was in charge of the whole thing, uh, decided to weigh back in on this whole thing, since he's an admiral. And his uh, answer was, release it right now. I got the email about four hours later, and everybody at the Coast Guard was freaked out because that was four hours ago, and he said it must happen immediately. I've never seen people jump so fast. <laughs> uh, so what happened based on that is uh, GeoPlatform, the public version of Vermont, immediately got live ships. And I think I was sitting next to Val at uh, the AV boot camp, getting phone calls from the Coast Guard saying, uh, we're paying, we have to have this release live now, please go. Uh, so this went out on a Friday evening about 7 p.m., suddenly it was live. And for the Coast Guard, this is a huge deal. This has been considered very sensitive data up until now. Uh, these ships are updated every two minutes with the, the official national tweet for where ships are. We also got some very unusual requests. Um, there's these little devices that they sell. It's about 100 bucks plus, uh, I think it's uh, 50 bucks a year. You hit the button on here, and it sends a message up to a satellite and tracks you. Uh, you just stick it in your pocket on, and if you're not me in, in New England, it actually works. I tried to take it around UNH and it never found me. But down here in the Gulf, closer to the uh, better view of the sky, these are actually uh, small boats, the NRDA NOAA teams, uh, carrying these devices around. They're being tracked by this bot company that sells these. Uh, the Coast Guard convinced, uh, and NOAA convinced uh, Spot to go ahead and give us a data feed, and then they convinced us to go ahead and put that data feed in Irma. So if you have a responder account on this thing, you can actually go see where all these boats are around if they've got one of these dropped in. You know, sometimes it's sitting on the dash, sometimes it's on a person. We also got other weird requests. Uh, most of the Coast Guard people use a cell phone service called Good. It actually tracks where you are every few minutes. And the Coast Guard said, we would like you to track everybody. He said, excuse me? Uh, you want me to track what? And he said, well, everybody's running this on their Blackberries and iPhones and whatnot. We want you to track them using good. And I realized I would then know where Admiral Allen was up to every 15 minutes. And I said, no, that's OK. Um, we'll figure out some other way to do it, because I don't want to know where everyone is. They're, sometimes information is just too much. An example of the uh, too much, they uh, want us to track all planes. And uh, they started sending us plane data. And so here's one of the files they sent us so over in Florida as a test. And it was just tons of data about planes flying around. And no, no information about is the plane actually doing something relevant to the, uh, the situation. So a lot of what happens here is data overload. And trying to go into these people and ask them to say, can you flag your data somehow as important to responders or not important to responders? It's very challenging. Another example of that is photographs. Someone went and photographed all the coastline and uh, from an aircraft, and then didn't tag it in any way. So we had tons of photographs sitting in the database, and no way to know which ones are important. You have to go through and guess yourself which ones are important. Pretty challenging. Now, getting back to that WMS, the web mapping service, I want to show something that's happening in our building right here. Uh, this is NowCoast, and uh, NowCoast is tracking all sorts of data from all over the government, and probably not even stuff in the government. And uh, here is a hurricane coming through. And what NowCoach does is it actually takes the same data that's uh, sending out the web interface uh, for humans and sends it out to web mapping service so we can subscribe to it in Irma. And the best part is that by being in the same building or on the same campus, we're really you know, able to go over and figure out what those interfaces are and pick out the best data. So that when NowCoach is tracking something that's important, uh, Irma should be tracking it too. So here's, you know, uh, a large storm coming through this way. So this one didn't bother the team too much. But um, Hurricane Bonnie happened during this time and uh, came right up through the middle 
Uh, thankfully, it died out before it caused too much trouble. But when you're trying to deal with uh, operations at a, a, a site that's got that much sensitivity, trying to have ROVs down, many thousands of people working on very sensitive tasks, uh, a bad sea state is not a good thing. Along with that, we pulled uh, significant wave height. So here you can see we could load in that track or even significant wave height. Uh, again, we have these strange SLDMB buoys running around tracking things. Uh, but this way you can integrate all these data sets and see them either in now coast, if you're comfortable with now coast, or in Irma if there's stuff that you need to match up that's there. Uh, here's something from a column. This is the flow of minutes data laid in the back with some transparency. So you can see the ships moving around on top of the currents. Um, I'll get back to this in a bit, but we didn't have a lot in the way of the imagery. Uh, this is a single beam survey from the 80s that NOAA found in the archives and the NOAA's map of. Um, but we didn't have a great multi-beam survey available to us. And uh, companies like BP may have stuff like that, but they wouldn't give it out. So we didn't have great bathymetry in the area, which is kind of surprising. Before getting that, one thing that, that's brand new to Irma and the services here uh, at Seacom is that, that Seacom is actually watching parts of Irma and keeping track of it uh, automatically. It's something that Jordan and I put together uh, where we have a program called Nagios that's every few minutes going out and pinging a whole bunch of the system to say, are you okay? And as part of that, we actually have a graph now of how many ships are seen every 10 minutes. This is, uh, these are days across the bottom, and you can see daily cycles of number of ships seen in the network. Uh, the nice thing about this is every so often something goes wrong. It usually seems to happen at about 10 p.m. on Saturday evening, and it usually involves a call from Admiral Allen to me, via one of his captains, saying, my favorite ship has disappeared off the map. Let it go. Um, and it means that somewhere, somewhere uh, in the network, uh, for example, one time it happened uh, down in uh, West Virginia, we had a network error. Uh, we had a dropout for about six hours and about half the data. A whole bunch of the ships out of the Gulf of Mexico just disappeared. But this way, I get an email before Admiral Allen figures out that the ship is there. Uh, a really great thing about this kind of system when you're using open source is you can go and say, hey, based on the public data, would someone be willing to contribute a particular interface? We, we need some help. We don't have any money, but if, if someone wanted to just volunteer out of the goodness of their heart to do something like that. And I have an idea. There's an interface called Simile Timeline, done at MIT, which is a web interface for viewing timelines. And uh, a guy named Jim Myers, I just posted a note saying, anyone want to go for it, I'll talk to you through the process if you want. Um, I don't have time to do it. He uh, went and bought a little uh, web domain, lowspillstats.com, and he put together an interface on the web that anyone can go to, just type that into your browser. And if you scroll on the bottom, uh, you can just scroll on the hour level, the day level, or the month level, and all the little events that happen throughout the, the spill response goes through and by you. So if you have a day that you were interested in looking at what's going on, you can see throughout the day, as all the Twitter events happen from all the government agencies, and anything that's publicly available you can grab, you might put it into this interface, you can scroll through it and watch what happened. Uh, if you're going back and doing sort of post-mortem analysis of some aspect, you can then sort of dial into your day and get a sense of what was happening back then. Now, there's a big question. Are we ready for another oil spill as a community? So we've just, just been through a long event, which is very unusual. Normally it uh, still happens, it's a small thing, you get cleaned up and you go away. Um, even with the Exxon Valdez, the primary response was fairly short. Um, the amount of oil was, was small compared to this one. But having this time to, to sort of work through things, we could go through, come up with an idea, try it on the oil spill, didn't work, try the next one, and see what we could do. Um, my answer to that is probably we're ready right now. Um, but the problem is with time, this knowledge gets lost. A lot of people move on to new jobs. Those who've been through it before retire or you know, move on to a different portion of the company. And those who are in those positions, uh, and then the next oil spill happens are brand new. And, uh, a key aspect of that is everyone's tired. People put in a lot of hours. There's been a lot of seven day a week, you know, 12 hour a day events going on for people. And uh, our two folks in charge here are showing it too. Another, another challenge for us here outside of the oil spill itself for those who are trying to come up with technologies uh, for this kind of thing. This is the one and only picture I have that shows Irma in action at a Coast Guard Center in the Gulf. Um, there's kind of a band. Some people told me they tried to take photos for me. 
and they've been disallowed from taking out cameras in the operations center. So I have no idea what it looks like or how Irma is set up in various places throughout the uh, infrastructure. So this is one press release this is released by the Coast Guard of Flickr. Uh, it was skimming through pictures, I'm like, wait, that looks familiar. <laughs> so that's the one picture I have of Irma in action in the Coast Guard Center. That's in a mobile command center in uh, Alabama. No, but it's up in the back, which is the idea. If you guys spend too much time with Irma, it's not working. So where to next? I have a few more minutes. I just want to give you a sense of what might come uh, for future technology and how we can do a lot better, because we definitely aren't there for a, a perfect system. Uh, the first one is mobile devices. You know, things like um, an iPad. This iPad has a 3G modem in it, so anywhere that you have cell coverage, you can get data to and from it. Um, this is the fire uh, attack group in Sonoma County. So this is wine country. Uh, this guy outside has been able to get grapes. And uh, he's actually moving planes around California for the wildfires. And he sends out these guys. He's an observer. And this is a, a plane that drops retardants on fires. And they've been working with NASA and they're joining them on some of their work. And uh, the idea is giving them Android phones where they can actually use them in the field. Uh, here's some other examples of, of mobile devices in the field. But give them to the first responders so they can interact with their command teams a lot better. I'd like to show you this example. This is actually just going on as we walked in the command center. This guy didn't have time to talk to us because he just got a call. Um, he's just dispatched a pilot in that little observation plane. He's trying to get out to the fire as fast as possible. And he's just gotten a message back from this guy. The pilot has actually carried the Android phone with him, held it up to the window, and took a picture as he approaches the fire. And the best part is the phone takes care of the rest. It's geo-referenced everything, and he gets back a picture looking out over this lake of the pilot approaching it. You just sort of see some hazy stuff in there. That's a big forest fire that's about to get a lot bigger. So he immediately had a sense of what the pilot's seeing up there without the pilot having to spend five minutes describing where the fire is, what it's doing, what the state is. The, uh, the observer out here is supposed to be talking about the planes, not back to the command center. In addition to mobile devices, we want to look at more command and control. This is something that Lee Alexander and I have been struggling through for a couple of years. Uh, all these ships carry these AIS transceivers. You can actually send data back out to the ships and have it put on their charts. We're looking for ways to be able to say, uh, where on the water is the oil? Where on the water should you be? Um, so basically, instead of having those 15 minutes of, of calling everybody and saying, OK, you're here, you need to be over there, and the oil's over here, um, we want to be up right on the chart, automatically, electronically done, and the, the guys working on the ships are just looking at the chart and glancing at it, and they're off doing their main job looking out the window and dealing with the oil. Uh, this is, the next one is a big CECOM topic. Um, we definitely need better background data sets. That little thumbnail of single beam sonar data for bathymetry, that's not OK. Um, NOAA's been working hard with their survey ships to collect bags, uh, got the attributed grids all around the country. This is some other work I've been doing with Shep Smith um, to try and track all that work being done by our hydrographic survey fleet. I'm going to zoom into here, but you can see that there's a lot of survey going on, but it's a big ocean. Uh, so there, there's a ton of work going on here, but there's a huge area you know, of critical stuff full of oil platforms that hasn't been surveyed in time recently. If you zoom in, this data is great, but look, there's huge gaps. It's too shallow in here. You know, we need some sort of wider coverage probably in this area. And this is the main shipping channel, which is no primary requirement, but there's no uh, money to go out here with other vessels and survey that. So I believe Larry is working on that issue, trying to push forward on getting a more complete coverage of this whole area, because with so many oil platforms out there, there's just bound to be trouble. We've already had one more uh, explosion since the Deepwater Horizon, if it's a small one. And the key thing to go with this is that we need continued testing, training, vigilance, and collaboration among everybody to keep those skills that we've won the hard way from going away from the Ixtaki, Ixtaki? Uh, how we pronounce the Mexican event that happened in 1979, a huge nine-month blowout, and the uh, Exxon Valdez, we pretty much lost 80% of that knowledge about how to deal with these events. And everyone out there is pretty much new and green at this. And we need to keep that from being the case again when it happens again in the future. We want people to, to absorb that knowledge from those who went through it now. So thanks for listening. Um, I always have to say we're charting the future. Uh, things like that, figure out where we're going. And 
it, uh, if you want to know more, uh, most of the stuff that I can put up on the web, I put up on the web. Uh, I've got a blog that, that talks about some of the stuff a little bit obtusely, depending on what I was allowed to talk about at the time. And the software uh, for everything that I've written for all of uh, Irma is actually up on the web that you can download if you'd like. Thanks. Questions? Oh. Uh, some piece of this, I'm not saying that it's a major piece, but some piece of this was the subsurface oil in the deep ocean. Mm -hmm. You have a very two dimensional. Yep. Um, any, any thought of getting current data, glider data, CDD data, all that kind of stuff kind of down in that part of the response? The, the blue water column and bottom stuff is definitely important. And some of it's in there, uh, it's fairly restricted. And the problem is that I know people here have been accessing it, but I don't have permission to translate it from my source to people who I think should get it. I don't have permission to make that bridge for some of it. The other thing is that this is never going to be a 3D tool. So if you want to look at things like structure in the water column, this web interface is probably not the thing you want to use. It might be the way you want to find the data that you can download and then go load this other tool. It's a perfectly way, reasonable way to do this kind of thing. To try and do anything that has a lot of vertical structure to it and a 2D web mapping interface is just not going to work very well. So that's any thought about how to get around that? Because guiding that portion of the response was something that was really important to do and yep. never get that. Yep. Um, I think some of that, like the glider stuff is in there and tracking where gliders are, but we had a communications problem. So somebody added the data in, it was layer 5012. We have, I think, 8,000 layers right now. There's no mechanism that lets me tell the community who's involved in this that that's what happened. I have one point of contact that I can call up and harass, and then hopefully they can go find people to harass. But in terms of like CCOM, we have walking around the halls, you and I talked about things. Um, we kind of have a back channel, but that back channel isn't really authorized. So we did it anyway, but. Um, there isn't a way in Irma, like latest news, new features, um, this data just came in, this data was just chucked out because of X, Y, or Z. Uh, we had several layers that showed up, weren't right, and we had to kill them. Uh, someone may have used that, I don't know. There was, no one ever told me how much it was being used until it broke. And then Saturday night at 10 o'clock, I got the phone call of, we've been loving this tool and it stopped working. Oh, someone's using it, great, that's wonderful. So we did those kinds of things throughout the system, like the ADCP data. I knew it was there. I didn't know how to get it. I knew where it was going verbally, but didn't actually know where that was. Um, so we have a lot of work to do with crossing some of the barriers between organizations like BP and the government. That barrier sometimes is very difficult. Um, ADCPs are on our other website, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I was told that was restricted data. National Data Police for right. every breakdown that has one there. That's great. Main data that I want. Great. See, that, that's, that information is hard to find sometimes yeah, when you're in the middle of something that is really restricted. Um, I actually called up the Ocean Observatory about 10 miles from that spill site. I found out just like a long time. Really? Yeah. It's an observatory? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so I actually called up BP at one point and then got a call from Noah saying, don't talk to BP again directly. So it's tough. You know, I was trying to get data from from BP to go to the Coast Guard, get to the right person, and the legal issues involved in the oil spill sometimes trump sanity. So I think this is basically just a platform we have to use to jump forward and to find these things and identify them. And sometimes it's going to be lawyers in there who have to go and get get over it and figure out a way to do the problem. Yeah, I, uh, I have two comments. One is I think you ought to add to your list of priorities something like the timeline feature because a lot of the information there is sort of persistent, but a lot of it is really temporal in nature and gets stale after a while. And if you have the ability to scroll through the map and look, sort of watch everything come and go as it came and went, and then and or organize the layers by time in some way, yep. I think that would be really helpful, especially for someone who doesn't, is just coming into the project and hasn't watched it evolve over time. 
Exactly. The other thing, is, and this gets a little bit to Tom's comment, is that uh, I think even if you had had a lot of the scientific subsurface data feeds coming in, they would have been really hard to present in a way that um, people can digest quickly. For example, um, the subsurface layer monitoring stuff, there's a bunch of CT CTD casts. You could have, you could have, I mean, you can all, you already have the locations of where those casts were, and you could have clicked on those and shown the profile. But it would take hours of going through and looking at all the profiles and looking at the dates to try to get the big flick of what's there. And the real information in that was a couple of points around a particular layer okay. that could have been gridded and, and shown as a grid and would have been immediately obvious what was going on. And so I wonder if, if it makes sense to define a handful of data products that would be good to show for any kind of slow response and try to get NOAA or whomever to put a processing pipeline in place as part of their slow response that says, okay, we need to produce these kinds of data products. We're going to assign this group of people to do it and funnel all the raw data in one end and put stuff out to you on the other. I think those are great ideas. Um, we're thinking about a lot of that. The one biggest factor here is that when you saw those pictures of people working on paper, what people ask for is, I want to print out of Irma. And you see people running around with printouts of Irma with three layers on it. And then someone asks them a the question, they run back and make another printout. We have a mentality of the computer is scary to some people, and it, it, it can be very scary, the tools definitely are not good. But we also have some institutional barriers, such as uh, no produces a chemical database that the Coast Guard requires. Um, it has a time life before that information expires. The Coast Guard review time for the software from NOAA to be deployed in the Coast Guard environment is longer than the lifetime of the data. So we have some institutional problems where it's a 13-month review process. The data is good for six months. So by the time you validate the data, okay to put in the Coast Guard system, you should throw it out. So those kinds of things tend to trump the what we'd like to do when we present all the data in the best way that we can. And so things like FlowViz 2D from Colin circumvent that whole process. You go do something on the research side, and then you kick it in, and magically just suddenly appear to people, whoa, look at this. We need more of that, but we don't always have funding or time to do it. Some of what you're talking about, some of those distilling those you know, thousands of CTD vertical casts to some kind of flat file, and then and then making an image out of that. That actually happened. That actually happened. Larry actually was the guy who was providing that, and is actually still providing it um, using Fleeter Mouse, and tried really hard to get other people to use Fleeter Mouse, and some people did. Um, but the other thing that happened was eventually, I think, people picked up on the idea that, hey, that's useful information to guide the response, the subsurface response. Um, and they started doing it in the GIS and started doing just what you described and are, I think they just stopped maybe a couple of days ago, um, providing that every day they would provide an updated plot of the data for the last few days. But to have it in something like this would be much more powerful, particularly if you have it at the timeline. And I think they just didn't know. Yeah, and we have a lot of disconnects here. For example, the, um, the PDFs that I showed you up until recently, the modeler assumed that the PDF was the only source that people wanted. It's, it says their group is vetted, it's, you know, it's got all the things that they think are important, but it's a paper. So someone who's trying to then throw something else with it in their GIS is out of luck. So we need to be able to get everybody to understand what the requirements are and not overload them. There's a lot of people who are working as much as they can and just can't do it anymore to get this thing to do. Um, the other thing is that uh, up till recently, NOAA has thought about oil spills as the surface and stuff on the bottom. It's, you know, you're in a river, it's 30 feet deep, it's either on the surface or it's hit the bottom. And well, within a few hours, it's the bottom. This is a very different case than almost everything I've dealt with before. So the midwater stuff is really good. Question? Yeah, what, almost all of the requests that hit your system are geographic in, in some way. Yep. There's, and, and I've seen some interesting sort of post analysis of, of EMS systems and things like that where you, you can just follow how many hits, what areas, you can begin to build statistics on who's using your data mm -hmm. and what it's doing. And you, you might want to think about what that could provide to you during mm -hmm. an implementation. You, you, you would 
you would maybe know more than you wanted to about who and where and what people were querying. Yep. Um, and that, that might give you a, a way to come back at the system and see how it was used. That's great. You know, right now we've been struggling with just scaling up from 50 users to uh, several million hits a day, like 10 million hits a day. Um, but you can, you can drive through the, the Apache part logs and actually begin to pull the, some of that. The one trouble here is that a lot of those logs and a lot of those hits are going all over the place. It's very distributed. Mm -hmm. So um, some of our log machines aren't able to keep those logs around. They're just getting so many hits. We're, we're, we're dumping a lot of stuff that we'd like to keep. And um, we're pulling dirty messages from all over the place. And we don't have time to figure out which is the active ones and when they get what turns into what else. So we have a, you know, yeah, it does have that sort of spider character to the bit, but yep. you might be able to just have something distilling those logs in real time. That would be, that would be wonderful. Yep. Yeah. Question on the back, yeah, um, yeah um, you touched on a really important issue, and I think a very, very difficult one. I just wanted to hear more of your opinion, which is the, you know, how do you preserve it? You, you can build a sort of, um, you know, you could spend unlimited amount of money. You could have a team of 20, 30 people building the perfect armor, you know, for, for, for years, and then it only gets exercised, you know, besides which nobody would fund that. I mean, should it be should it be CCOM that maintains? Should it be NOAA? Should it be the private sector? I don't know. Or, or how, how does um, something that you put together started to learn how to how to do things right, learn a lot of lessons, how do you preserve all of that? Preserving is definitely a big challenge. Um, the commercial model has failed so far. So 